Welcome everybody to a big Wednesday and it is the month of miracles, May miracles. And wow, have the miracles been happening. They're coming in. And if you have a miracle, please tell us about it because people are being healed. People are being financially blessed. There is incredible things that are happening here in the month of May at Family Christian Center. We prayed last week for signs and wonders to come upon the people. I want to excite you and tell you there is a wonder following. There's wonders that have been pronounced over you that have been attending, watching Family Christian Center, and there are signs following you. We are believing as we stretch forth our hands, as the Bible said, they healed and signs and wonders followed them. We're believing that God is going to let your dream come to pass. It's Wednesday night. Tonight, Perry Stone. I love when Perry Stone comes because more people have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in one night with Perry Stone. Year after year when he comes, we see the mighty demonstration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And tonight, it's going to be packed full of the anointing. I talked to Perry. He told me, he said, I have a message that God has given me. And I want to tell you that you don't want to miss, you don't want to miss a moment of what's going to happen on this big Wednesday night. I'm excited that you are a part. So come on, let's, let's get ready. We're going to worship. Good worship. We're going to pray. And God is about to do something great in your life. It's May Miracles, so get ready for a miracle to happen to you. Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave. Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, racing, waiting for you. Dance like the way that you just did, racing, waiting. When the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom.
a great big hand clap. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. How many is expecting God to do great things here tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we move into prayer, everyone here tonight, as we begin to say, oh God, touch every single person. Lord, let your presence be upon every single person. And as they continue to sing it, everyone that has, everyone that has, you want a job and, and you have your, you have something you want to bring to the altar. You have the resume. As they sing it, let us all agree that the people that are marching, people that are coming, there's going to be better, better favor, better blessings. As they sing it, come wherever you are in the building, bring your resume.
Everybody stretch your hands toward these opportunities. How many believe that God wants to give opportunity to his believers and those that believe? These are the resumes. All of these are the resumes of people who say, I believe God's gifts and talents and all that I've strived to this time. I want God to bless me. I want him to bless me. I declare, if somebody just say with me, I declare, I declare that in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus favor, favor is going to be upon all these resumes. And in the month of May, miracles miracles are going to happen to everyone who filled out a resume. I just want everybody to know that you filled it out and you've given it to God. And I believe, somebody stand with me. I don't want to be by myself. I believe, I believe that, God that God is going to respond, is going to, respond to every resume, to every resume and every person, every person that needs a job, that needs a job or, more or more than enough. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name, miracles are happening. Miracles are going to happen. Father, we believe it to be done. And everybody in the house, lift your right hand in the air and receive now this prayer that in the name of Jesus, every need is going to be met in your life. That God, you're about to speak and demonstrate that God, you're going to do a mighty work in the name of Jesus tonight, right now. Somebody shout right now. Right, right now. now. Lord, there's going to be a right now word, a right now healing, a right now deliverance, a right now, oh God. There's going to be a promotion and there's going to be favor. And Lord, with the hands lifted for those watching and those in this house, in the name of Jesus Christ, let the miracle happen not to one, not just to a few, but every person that is in this house, every person that is watching, every person that is in tune, receive now God's very best, God's very utterance, God's very, very precious gifts upon everyone that is in this house gathered by streaming and everybody shout in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now the hand is lifted in the air. Even you that are watching, bring it down to your heart and I want you to take your faith and I want you to say, I believe, I believe. what was prayed over me, prayed over me. spoken over me, spoken over me. In the name of Jesus, I believe something's going to happen in my life, a healing, a deliverance, a favor. God is releasing on my life, not just tomorrow, but right now, right now. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Alright, everybody that has that faith, begin to praise him. Yeah. Begin to praise him. You, begin Jesus. to praise him. Come on, begin to praise him. Come on, let there be a shout. Let there be a praise. I believe it. I believe it. I declare it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, come on, a few thank you, Lord. A few I worship you, God. A few thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody help me with a few hallelujahs. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. And hallelujah. And hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look what the Lord is going to do. Look what the Lord is going to do. Now everybody get your expectation up. If you haven't got it up, I want to encourage you. I want to motivate you. I want to excite you. 
Get your expectations up. Expect anything. The man of God is in the house tonight. There's going to be a word that's going to be directly to you. The Holy Spirit's going to fall and you're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So expectancy is very important as we stand in the presence of God. The Bible said they went out to see John the Baptist with expectancy. There was expectancy. If you come tonight just to observe, look upon, judge, say, I'll just wait to see. Sorry, you'll miss your opportunity. But if you come with expectancy, if you come to saying, I know that God is going to do something in my life. Who do I got here tonight full of expectancy? Let me tell you one word. One word can change your life. When Perry Stone or ever how the Spirit moves tonight, when he starts coming up here, there might be one line, one word, one revelation. And that word will come, will come forth and you'll say these words, that's for me. Let's practice right now. Everybody say, that's for me. That's, that's for me. me. And, and something will come out. And what I love is when God sins from another part of the body of Christ, like Perry from Cleveland, Tennessee. And when he comes and ministers, what is so exciting, he doesn't even know what's going on. He don't know what's happening in your life. And all of a sudden, with your expectancy and faith, you'll say, he's talking directly to me. Something is going to happen. He's talking to me. And it's not him, but it's God speaking through him. Raise your level of expectancy. Let something in your heart be ready to receive and to say, I know something good is about to happen in my life. You know what I want you to do? I want you to build that with people around you by saying, you better get ready, it's going to happen to you. Can you do that to four or five people right now? You better get ready, that's going to happen to you. You better get ready, that's going to happen to you. You better get ready, that's going to happen to you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Wow, wow, what a great atmosphere of what God is doing. You may be seated, watch the screens.
to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday, happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. Mom and Dad started this church, and we're so glad to have her with us. And tonight, my sister is here from Tacoma, Washington, and they passed her several churches on the West Coast. And we're glad to have Sheila Muncy, my youngest sister, is here tonight. Give her a great big hand. Welcome. I'm so glad Sheila's here. Everybody shout, Happy Birthday, Mom! Happy Birthday, Mom! Absolutely. You may be seated. Sunday we rejoice with her. She sang. And uh, we, we love mom. Nope, nope, nope. Don't we? We love her singing. Nope. Stay right there. Nope. And tonight, tonight I want to say before we take our evening offering, and, and I believe I'm so excited about uh, the speaker tonight, but tonight as we join in together, and Wednesday night, we worship with our offering. I love to read a scripture verse to encourage you about your giving. You can do it with an envelope. You can do it with your phones. But 2 Corinthians teaches this so well. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly. If you don't like to give, keep your money. But if there are cheerful givers in the house, I'm telling you, there's something good. For God loveth a cheerful giver. What happens when a cheerful giver gives? Then God breaks out with a promise in the eighth verse. And God is able. This is what he says about giving. God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always have an all sufficiency, all sufficiency in all things. And you may abound to every good work. Three things there I see, grace, sufficiency, and abound. And I know that all of you need more grace because I have seen many of you leave the parking lot. It's amazing you are still here tonight the way you drive. How many knows we need all the grace we can get, all the grace raised on our children, going through life and doing the kingdom of God? So the Bible says when you give cheerfully, grace comes. Then the Bible says if you give cheerfully, you'll have sufficiency in all things. Then the Bible says you will abound. So let the spirit of abound as you give. As you give, it will abound. As you give, sufficiency will come. As you give, grace will come. You can do it by envelope. You that are watching, you can give. This is our Wednesday night. And so as we give, the singers are singing.
Everybody shout, I'm a cheerful giver. I'm a cheerful giver. Stretch your hands if you're a cheerful giver. If you've, gave, if you've given by phones, you can grab your phone and stretch it for, toward the offering. And Lord, we thank you. Look at the cheerful giving. Lord, let grace abound. Lord, let sufficiency come upon the people. And oh God, let there be, God, great, great favor and abound. Oh, thank you, Lord. And for those that are watching, look at all the phones and then all the people that are given. I, I am so excited, God, that people still obey you and trust you. Look at all the givers, God, and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody shout amen. Amen. I want to say thank you. I want to say the 6K run is this Saturday. Uh, I think that's three miles. Is that right? What is it? Come and watch me run 3.7 miles. Come and run or walk or, or just come and, and be a part. We're raising money so that we can send water to areas where there is no water. And there are especially children and people so we're going to run and uh, come we do it right here and then we our park that is right behind us and it is so much fun it's so much fun some of us run some of us walk some of us trot some of us don't make it some of us scooter whatever you do come come i'm gonna run i'm gonna run 3.7 miles and uh i believe i can do it how many believes we can do it together and we're raising, you can register in the lobby. I also want to tell you, Pentecost Sunday is a week from Sunday. also want to tell you, Summer Sizzle is going to be so exciting this year. We were planning it. And we started the 14th of June, and that's going to be so great. And this Sunday, as the word of the Lord, I believe, I believe, and I want everybody to know, uh, I went to the inauguration in Chicago of the change of leaderships of the new mayor of Chicago. And I, I will, I will, um, I want to tell you, uh, don't be critical too quick, but pray quickly. Pray quickly. And Sunday, I'll, I'll make mention of it, but I was so moved when they were singing total praise and something happened in that room. I want to tell you, Something happened in that room. And it was like, in my expression of testimony, it was like God saying, can I come in? And, it was, and Sunday I'll elaborate on, on uh, some details, but I want to tell you, Chicago deserves revival. Chicago needs revival. And I just want to encourage the body here. This is not about the Democrats or the Republicans, liberals or the conservatives. We easily can get on either side of the fence. But we that are kingdom people, we need to understand what we're dealing with. We're not dealing with flesh and blood. We are dealing with prince and powers of the air. I want to tell you something. I wasn't going to say this, but I want to tell you. At Friday morning prayer, there were hundreds of people here. They tell me that there is a good number that prays with us. And they tell me, and I don't know how all of this is calculated, but it goes into the multitudes of people, hundreds and into the thousands that pray with us. And I'm not accustomed, for years I've never prayed uh, in front of a camera, but through covid we, we begin to develop praying in front of a camera. I, I get a little uncomfortable with that, but we have continued up till this season and time. I'm on my knees and I'm praying. Those that were in um, the audience, the Spirit of the Lord came in to that prayer meeting. Something came upon me coming from India when you see all the demons that are cast out you begin to understand this is not flesh and blood. This is not denomination. This is not about parties. And we're so easily caught up 
in the blame game, but this is a prince in power. This is a prince in power. Paul teaches us this. And about 625, I, I begin to say things like this in prayer. In the name of Jesus, I bind the spirit of murder over Chicago. Is that all right? Has anybody read anything like that in the book? And as I was, I mean, I was, my heart and expression and emotions and faith was strong in this moment. This was about 625 because I was, I, I was, I was not trying to pay attention to the time, but I know that at quarter till we get up and take Holy Communion and thousands of us participate in that on Friday morning. But at 625, um, I, they give me a mic. They give me a mic to pray because of the others that are praying with us by social media. And my mic went out. My mic went out. And when the mic went out, I knew it wasn't the sound person's fault because the prince in power is in the air. He gets into the Wi-Fi. He gets into computers. He gets into signals, etc. So I immediately, excuse me for believing like this, but I immediately got mad at the enemy because I felt like I must have touched something of a prince in power. I must have. And so, without any further delay, I started getting up and acting like a soldier, just as Ephesians teaches us to put on the whole, more, whole armor of God. And I begin to declare war on that spirit. 45 minutes later, Pastor John Ponder, he is our, he is our media pastor. He's receiving all the people that are coming in to the prayer meeting, and he is monitoring Facebook, Twitter, whatever all of that is. And at 625, at the same time that my mic went out, they put him off Facebook and said, we're penalizing you for what you're saying. So Pastor John Ponder and I agreed about 7.30 that morning that we must have done damage. Am I by myself? Am I, is, am I the only one? So please don't think I'm weird, but I, we took authority. Then I said to John Ponder, I said, we cannot prove until Sunday night at the end of Mother's Day weekend how much damage we did to murder because there is an app that you can look upon and you can find out minute by minute shootings, what streets it on in the city of Chicago. There's an app, minute by minute, how many bullets are fired, who was shot, who was shot at, who was killed, not killed, minute by minute. And John Ponder and I agreed, talking about praying against Prince of Powers. We agreed that something good is going to happen this Mother's Day weekend. And that could it possibly be that we did some damage to the spirit of murder? Okay. So, I went home, turned on the television, it's now 9.30. All of a sudden, prime news comes on, NBC, ABC, the Chicago stations, and there's a shooter in one of the schools. And they evacuated the school. And the news broke in and said, it's mysterious because they couldn't find the shooter. And then it was mysterious. They was wondering how the call came in that the shooter was there. And that all the students and everyone in the neighborhood was really moved by this. But the news ended up saying, we don't know what happened, 
but the police has agreed there's no shooter. Excuse me, but I came off the couch and said, could it have been that we did some damage? Am I by myself on this? To the spirit of murder. So then, Monday morning, I looked at the statistics of Mother's Day weekend. And on the statistics of Mother's Day weekend, they said on all time low in the city of Chicago, of a Mother's Day weekend, and they gave last year's statistics and the year before, and this past weekend, they even said it's lower than it's ever been. I just want to declare it does work. I need some warriors here tonight. It does work. I need somebody to just help me believe it does work to pray and take authority over the spirit of murder. I want to do that in the next 30 seconds. Somebody stand up with me like a warrior and declare in the name of Jesus, we bind the spirit of murder. We bind the spirit of murder. We bind the spirit of murder over Chicago. The spirit of murder over our neighborhoods and our lives. In the name, somebody, in the name of Jesus, declaring we cast Hallelujah. 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 The murder spirit's going to come down in Chicago. Do I have any warriors that believe that we can cast that out? So I want to build your faith tonight. Build your faith. Keep praying. Keep believing. And tonight when the man of God steps up here, get ready for God to give you a special word. Turn to somebody and say, it's coming tonight right to you. Say it, it's coming to you. You may be seated, watch this. I'm excited about May miracles and tonight the miracles are continuing. Tonight, Perry Stone, been on worldwide television for over 25 years. He has made his impact with revelations about Israel, about revelations. But he's an evangelist and believes what God can do when it comes to using your faith. Let me tell you, Perry Stone is a preacher. He is a teacher. Recently in his conference with some over 7,000 in attendance there at his headquarters uh, campus there in Cleveland, Tennessee, I have been there, I have preached in this huge, vast building, auditorium that he's built, and God is really using Perry Stone. He travels every single week, but let me tell you, there's an anointing upon him. Would you welcome Evangelist Perry Stone? introduction like this you understand so I think I just need to put uh, Steve on side staff just to do my <laughs> introductions thank you pastor you're so kind and you can be seated good to have you in the service tonight and uh, we're going to get right into the word and I just want to say how much I love and appreciate pastor and and his wife and family and the relationship that we built over the years him and I and Jensen are very good friends and we try to talk I get I have a new phone, but I've had a new phone for two years, but he still has my old number. Come on, somebody help the man out. And he tried to call me the other day, couldn't get me in because he was on the wrong number. But anyway, I thank you so much for the times we get to be together. And I'm going to minister you. Give me about two and a half minutes. Charlie, run up here. you got to run, son. Like, like T.L. Lowry used to say, get the load out of your pants and run. Pick, pick your legs up and run. All right, real quick, let me show you this. If you watch our program or perhaps you've seen a, a teaching on YouTube, I'm very excited about the book that this is brand new called Your Journey into Eternity, Your Life for the Next 1,000 Years. 
And this goes into the moment you die all the way to when the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. And it'll answer a lot of questions. And then the Lord spoke to me from this verse of Revelation. It's one place in the Bible. There's a building in heaven called the Temple of the Tabernacle of the Testimony. All of your life's information from birth to death to everything you've ever said or done is put in records in that building. And it is where you will stand at the judgment seat. Everybody will. Uh, in Revelation 11 and 8 and be judged. And I want to give you the details of that building and what's in it. It's, it's probably uh, out, of, out of the top three messages that the Lord's ever given me. It's, it, it's one of my favorites. We have a limited amount of those. And then I'm going I'm to show you two things. Also, did you bring... Okay, the prophetic summit that he mentioned, Jonathan Kahn, Mark Biltz, me, Bill Cloud, Jimmy Evans, Lance Wallnow. We have those on DVD, CDs, and flash drives, but we only brought like 10 of each. So you can get those uh, tonight. Two gifts from Israel. Anybody like Israel around here? Anybody? Okay. The, these are from Jerusalem, and they're cashmere scarves. They're, they're not wool. They're cashmere. They feel like silk. And we had a shipment of them come in. At our conference, we had to go get them five times. The women were going crazy. You thought it was a blue light special on Thanksgiving. They're $10 each. They usually double or triple that in any store. And you can get it. I'm going to do something stupid. You can get as many as you want for $10 each, okay? And uh, they're, they they, while they last. And the other gift I brought for you, which is again from Jerusalem, is a... The, the seal of the early church, the messianic seal of the church, which was found on pottery, in the background is authentic Roman glass. They find a lot of glass. They polish it and cut it. And it's in a ster sterling silver necklace. And you can get those. And I think we, get, we do those for $40, which is less than you can ever get it on the Internet anywhere. So the, I only brought 20 of those, okay? That's kind of crazy. But I guess it's uh, early bird gets the word. Did y'all get that? I want to begin, normally I have a scripture that I go to for a text, and I'll save that for just a few moments, but I want to begin with the subject tonight of the secret that Satan does not want out. There's something that he does not want you to know. Now, I had a message I preached when I was here previously with a similar title. This is not the same message at all. It's completely different. But I want to make a statement to you, and that is this, that before you were ever converted to the Lord, your battle was concerning eternal life. Satan did everything he could to prevent you from gaining eternal life. Now that you're saved and have eternal life, you have a new battle. It's the battle over an abundant life. Because Jesus said, I come to give you life and more abundantly. He's not speaking about eternity or heaven. He's speaking about your life now. In the battle for abundant life, there are four areas that the enemy attacks you in. Area number one, Matthew chapter four, is the area of tempting you to sin. Area number two is trying to make your faith fail as a result of circumstances, Luke chapter 22. Peter is the example of that. The third example is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul talked about a spirit that hindered him from moving forward, doing what God wanted him to do in the ministry. So there are what I call hindering spirits. Anybody ever hit, met a two-legged hindering spirit? Come on, somebody. Some of you are married to one and related to one. Oh, my Lord, I didn't mean to say that. I don't know where that came from. The, the fourth, the fourth, <laughs> the fourth area of attesting is the temptation of accusing others before God or becoming an accuser of the brethren, which is the main job of Satan. So accusations, false information. And I just want to say something to you. Accusation is not evidence. People often accuse people and there's no evidence for the accusation because the devil is a liar, a slanderer, and an accuser. So it's very important to understand that. So your battle for abundant life can come from these four attacks that you deal with occasionally or from time to time. Now, the second thing I want to tell you is that there are weapons for every weapon Satan has. And I'm going to show you this very quickly from the Bible. First of all, let's talk about for just about one minute, the spirit of fear. The Bible says God did not give you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So how do you deal with the spirit of fear? One verse tells you, 1 John 4, 18, if you are in fear, you are not made perfect in love because perfect love casteth out fear. You can only battle fear when you understand the level of the love of God that he has towards you. 
You're a son, you're a daughter, you're a kingdom person. And when you understand the level of love, unconditional love that God has to you, it begins to sweep out any fear because then you know, my daddy's going to take care of me. Now, the second area of battle is oppression. There's a lot of people in the culture today, in North America especially, that are battling depression and oppression. How do you break fear by love, understanding the love of God? How do you break oppression? Acts 10, 38, Jesus was anointed to deliver all that were oppressed of the devil. Acts chapter, I'm sorry, Isaiah 10, 27. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So oppression and depression is broken by being in the presence of God where the anointing can overwhelm the power of the oppressive that's in your mind or body. So the anointing breaks the spirit of oppression. The third weapon Satan uses is temptation. Now, how do you deal with temptation? Matthew 4, Luke chapter 4, the same way Jesus did. He quoted the scripture against every level of temptation, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He quoted from Deuteronomy three different scriptures to every single mental attack that Satan was sending his way. So you handle temptation through the power of the word. And let me just say this. It's not just hiding the word in your heart to prevent sinning against God. That's a big part of it. But you have to speak it and you have to say it because authority is only released by speaking. Power is released by laying on of hands, but authority is released by speaking. And there are two different things in the New Testament. Fourth is sickness. Many people are battling spirits of infirmity or sickness. How do you deal with sickness? Acts chapter 3, verse 16, when the lame man was cured at the eastern gate, when Peter and John prayed for him, the Bible said it was the name of Jesus and faith in his name that made this man strong in the presence of you all. Now think about the four weapons that counter the four attacks of the enemy. The love of God and understanding the love of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God, and the authority that is behind the name of Jesus. However, I am going to take you on a brief journey right here to show you the key to all blessings, the key to defeating Satan in every single area of your life. And I will give you a verse in a moment that will authenticate everything that I'm about to say. But the first thing I would like to t talk to you about is the ages past. And I want to talk to you about ages past and tell you that in ages past, which was the time of the creation of the heaven and the earth, the Bible said there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. Now the Bible tells us that at the time of the early part of creation, if you go back to that time frame, you be, you'll begin to understand this, that everything that God created in heaven was spirit, pure spirit. There was no physical body created in heaven. God is a spirit according to Jesus. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew, which is the breath of the holies or the spirit of the holy ones. So he is spirit. That's why he's called Holy Spirit. And then you have Christ who in a resurrected body, he has a different body, but in the past he was the word that was made flesh. So therefore everything in the beginning dwells in spirit form. Would you agree with me? Everything in heaven is a spirit. Now this leads me to something very, very important and very, very interesting because there was one thing, uh, God help me, I haven't started preaching yet. There's one thing that exists that existed in over time that did not exist originally in heaven and presently is not in heaven itself when it comes to the spirits of just men that are in heaven, the departed souls of our loved ones, the Father, the Spirit, the, whole, the Holy Spirit, the angels. It does not exist. It, all, it never existed in heaven. And it was the most important substance that would ever be created in the history of the world. And that is called blood. 
spirits do not have blood. Angels are not cut and they do not bleed. God cannot bleed. Christ in, in, his, in his position of the word and creation cannot bleed. So in other words, everything is spirit, but heaven has no blood. Now that might explain a mystery that I've had a question about a long time. Track with me for just a moment. Satan rebelled against God and Revelation 12 says that he drew a third of the angels of heaven and did cast them down. Now we know this and we know that the scripture also teaches us that Satan said, I will ascend into heaven, exalt my throne above the stars of God, sit them out of the congregation in the sides of the north. Nowhere now, that, what, what was Satan's sin? Listen to me carefully. Satan's sin was pride. Even the prophet said you were lifted up in pride because of your beauty. Nowhere did I read in the scripture that Satan blasphemed the Holy Spirit. The only unpardonable sin that cannot be forgiven in scripture is to rail against and blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying Satan didn't do it, but there's no direct record of it. He led a rebellion. He was lifted up with pride and he was cast out of heaven because of that. Now here's my theological question to ask you. If a backslider who has no, let, no, let's go back. If an outright rank sinner who was a killer, a murderer, a rapist can come to the knowledge of the Lord and truly repent, and men have and women have, then, then and if a person has been wicked and evil and all the angels did was rebel against God, what they did was be lifted up with pride, then why can't fallen angels ever repent? Why can't Satan ever, let me tell you something. If if I were, the, were Satan and I know where the end is going to take me to the lake of fire, if I had a possibility of saying to God, I am so sorry for what I did, is there any way for me to have forgiveness? I think I would do that. I think the fallen angels, according to the Bible, some of them that fell with Satan, according to 2 Peter 2, 4, the book of Jude, are now bound in a place called Tartarus, which is the lowest hell, uh, the lowest part of hell underneath the center of the earth. So they're now bound in chains. Okay, they have to await the judgment according to the Bible. So the next thing Satan has to encounter with God will be when we judge the angels. How many know the Bible says we will judge the angels? And when Satan and the fallen angel stands before God. But I meditated on this. I said, Lord, I'm just going to be honest with you. If I were the enemy, if I were those fallen angels, if I thought there was any way that I could make it right and repent, you take a backslider, you let them repent. You take a pagan and a heathen, you let them repent. You take murderers and molesters and, and, and rapists or whatever they might be. And if they truly turn their heart and turn to you, you let them repent. Why can't Satan repent? And God gave me two reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, he is spirit. When he, when, once, once you are in that spirit form, you are eternal. Oh, come on. When you're a body and a soul and the spirit, your body goes to the dust, your soul and spirit goes back to God that gave it, and you're never going to die. You will either spend eternity with God or eternity away from God. You will either be in heaven and rule on the new earth, or you will be in hell. There's only two places you can go, because once the spirit leaves the body, it can't die. That's the reason why God never destroyed the devil. They used to grow up and say, how come God even let the snake in the garden? Why didn't God destroy the devil when he fell from heaven? Can I tell you why? Because nothing that comes out of God can die. Because everything that God has is absolute life. He is pure light and he is pure life. In him there's no shadow of turning. In him there is no darkness. And that's the reason why the word was inspired of God or breathed out by God. So God breathed out his words. The prophet picked up on it and wrote it down. And that's why he said heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. Your spirit is the breath of God. In your mama's mama's womb, God breathed into you a body. He made a body, but he put a soul and spirit. And because that soul is eternal, Satan is the same way. He was created an angel. As an angel, he's a spirit. God can't kill it. He can confine it. God can't kill it. He, oh God, you got to understand. The reason he can't kill it is it came out of him. And if it come out of God, it cannot die. It cannot cease to exist. And that's why there's eternal death. And that's why there's eternal life. Because in eternal death, you're still living. Come on, somebody. So number one, he can't repent because he's in a condition where as a spirit, he fell as a spirit. The second reason is, well, get ready now. Because he doesn't have any blood. 
God help me. I said he didn't have any blood because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Let me say it again. Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood, but without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Why do you think for 1500 years, they took an animal, a lamb and laid it on the altar. They took an ox and laid it on the altar. They took pigeons and turtle doves and laid them on the altar. They took a lamb in the morning and the lamb in the evening because it was a representation of what was to come because without the shedding of blood there was no covering there was no kapoor there was no atonement so you got to understand something that the secret that heaven had that God never told the devil about was something called B-L-O-O-D blood To take you a little bit further into this, I'm going to give you the very first prophecy of the Bible. The first prophecy of the Bible was not given by a prophet. It was given by God himself. And it was the moment that Adam and Eve were expelled out of the garden. In Genesis 3.15, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent, but he's actually speaking to Satan who used the serpent. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. It shall bruise his head and thou shalt bruise his heel. If if I were the enemy listening to that prediction and I heard this phrase, the seed of the woman, I would be just a little bit confused because as I begin to travel through the pages of the Bible, I begin to understand that the word seed is not connected to a woman. The word seed in the Bible is always connected to men or to the male. It's called the sperm in the loins of a man's body. And this is the reason why in the Bible it says Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judah and Judah begat it's always talking about men begatting men begatting no they weren't they weren't transvestite men I just want you to understand that right now no they weren't I'm going to give you the, I'm just going to give you the understanding because I'm really some people get a little weird when you talk about this kind of stuff so they, they weren't they were men but the point is that these men begot men you, men don't beget a man men don't have a woman it's a woman that begets in fact when you start reading the genealogies it'll mess you up because in Luke's gospel Matthew's gospel well, there's the genealogy of Jesus and there's only five women mentioned in the whole bunch and one of them is Sarah one of them is Mary one of them is Rahab but only five but you see it always a man begot a man begot a man begot now why because of the terminology found in scripture the terminology of the scripture is when God would talk to a man about his kids that were coming for generations he would say I'm gonna give this to you and your seed and your seeds seed because it takes the seed of a man to go into a woman and fertilize the egg and create a baby. Now the woman's still having the baby. Let's give the women, come on, let's clap our hands and give women the credit for having the baby. But normally, 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 you don't have a baby unless you have a seed. So check this out. The entire time for 4,000 years, Satan's trying to figure out who is the seed. So when Cain and Abel are born after the incident in the Garden of Eden, Satan raises up and moves on Cain's heart to become a murderer. Cain kills Abel. So then he took out Abel and he, then he took out spiritually Cain. So what are they going to do now? Well, God raised up Seth. So Satan continues to try this thing. And if you've ever noticed in the Bible, Satan never is attacking the girls. He's always attacking the men. There are, come on, somebody. There's always more women in church than there are men. There's always more women getting saved than there are men. There's more women getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost than there are men. I'll tell you who the givers are. You know who the givers are? 80% of the givers in a church are women. Not down on the men, but I'm going to make a point right here. Hey, hey, hey. When you understand this and you begin to see how Satan always was attacking the men. He tried to kill the infants right after they were born in Egypt to get rid of the deliverer Moses. He tried to kill the infants in Bethlehem and the soldiers did in order to try to stop the, the man child Jesus Christ from being born. So the attack was always on the seed. But see, I'm telling you that what God did was he messed with the devil and he messed with him for 4,000 years. So all the time the enemy's 
is waiting for a man to come and maybe he's the deliverer, waiting for a man to come and maybe he's the promised seed, waiting for a man to come. God had this thing messed up because he didn't say the seed of a man is going to crush your head. He said the seed of a woman's going to crush your head. Now my perplexity associated with how this works is a woman doesn't have the seed, the woman has the egg. And so we know that if you look at it, it's sperm and egg. It's seed and egg. Fertilization of the egg. You've got to have the seed of a man. But that ain't what God said. God said seed of a woman. I was perplexed and I was puzzled. And I said, God, what did you mean when you said to the devil, the seed of a woman? He said, well, go to John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made which is made. And the word dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. He tabernacled with us. He said, now what is the word? And I went to Mark chapter 4 and it says, and the sower sows the seed. And the seed falls on good ground. The seed falls on rocky ground. The seed falls on some thorns and thistles. But if it falls on good ground, it produces. And then the interpretation comes. Lord, what is the seed? He said, the seed is the word of God so here's how God faked the devil out he faked him out by saying there's a seed of a woman and all the time he's looking for a seed of a man but all of a sudden a virgin by the name of Mary gets a visitation by the angel Gabriel and said Mary you're highly favored among women the, the, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you and the power of the most high shall overshadow you and that holy thing which is born of you shall be called the son of God let me tell you who the what the seed of the woman was ready the seed was the word of God that existed with God that was made flesh that was the seed and the devil didn't know that's what was about to happen oh Jesus because what the enemy did not expect, and one, pro one prophet told him, one prophet told it, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ, begins to tell about a, uh, the Hebrew word there. Th th some say that means just a young girl. No, 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 no. Because it says when Mary conceived, it was a fulfillment of that verse. It's a virgin. Come on. Anybody can be a young. You might be a young woman, not be a virgin. But Mary was a virgin, which means she never knew a man. So when God takes the seed of his word and implants the word... The book of Hebrews said, a body thou hast prepared for me. So God prepares the body. And, and Jesus comes forth. But I don't want to get so caught up in this that, that we, we get into all the, the, the medical things and this and that and the other. Because sure as the world, I'll miss it. And the top nurse in Chicago is in the building tonight. So I'm not about to, with my luck. <laughs> so here we go. And that is this. If a girl becomes pregnant... So, and they say, we don't know who the father is. Would somebody tell me what can they do now that they couldn't do years ago? Everybody knows it's DNA. It's been on television. It's been on programs. And, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't really enjoy watching this guy because he was, he was a little bit on the edge. And, and you, you know what I'm talking about. He'd have all these people on the, the reveal. And the, there'd be uh, you know, five men and a girl there. And the, the reveal would come. And she'd go crawling hair out and kicking chairs over and, it just depressed me. I just said, I can't, I can't watch this. I, I got to have some edification here. But you remember, you saw those. And okay, so the, now what's the DNA? The DNA is a test that goes into the blood because the blood has markers that if that's the dad, it carries those markers in. in uh -huh. In fact, it carries a marker that might have that daddy's nose, that daddy's hair, that daddy's skin color. It could have that. It, I mean, you start looking, you say, I know whose baby that is. <laughs> he ain't fooling me. I know whose baby that is. Because of what? DNA markers that the DNA reveals the patterns of the body type and the blood type. Are you still tracking with me? There was a reason. 
that God could not use Abel's blood because the Bible talks about Abel's blood, the first righteous man who shed his blood and said his blood was not sufficient for there was a blood that was going to speak of better things. So when Christ was born of the virgin, there is no male seed, which means the DNA of a man was not present as there would be every other child born. Uh, but I come by to tell you, there was a heavenly DNA from the position of the Father in heaven. Oh, yeah, he said, if you looked at me, you've seen my Father. Because my father is a healer and I'm a healer. My father's position is a deliverer, so now I'm a deliverer. My father is as the father in heaven. The will was to deliver, to heal, to save, set free, to let captives go free, to open blind eyes. So when you see me do something, just remember I have the DNA of the almighty God in a human body. My God. Now, everybody still track and put your hands together and shout a praise to God. Now, I want to show you something that's kind of the biblical side of this, but I want to show you something practical, and I, I need your participation here. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. God Almighty is a God of unity. He's a God. Of, would you agree? He's a God. Because the Bible said God's not the author of. What's confusion? It's disunity. Anytime you have confusion, you have division. You have disunity. And I've never seen a country more messed up trying to divide us and separate us. You know what I'm talking about? And that's not from the Lord. This division, this hate, this, even if it's racial hatred, none of it's from God. It's demonic. But the enemy wants to conquer and divide or divide and then conquer, I should say. So, whew. the fall of Lucifer created a division in which all truth has an opposite. Watch. There was no hell in the beginning of creation. And I can prove it by Matthew's gospel where Jesus said, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Let's get heavy. In Genesis 1, 1, everything is perfect. The heavens and the earth are perfect. Verse 2, darkness is upon the face of the deep and there's water all over the planet. Between Genesis 1, 1, when all things were created perfect, and Genesis 1, 2, when the chaotic earth happened, it was the fall of Lucifer. And God had to go to the earth and create hell in the center of this earth. And that is why the, all these scientists say, well, the earth was cooling off at one time. Even the evolutionists have water on the earth. Well, guess what? It was cooling down because hell was there. And then God set out to recreate things. Are you still tracking with me? Hello. Now, what happens is there is suddenly a kingdom of opposites. And if, it, if something exists in the natural, you can have a real $100 bill and you can have a fake counterfeit $100 bill because the real 100 exists in the natural. You have every product created on the planet and you have knockoffs. Come on, ladies. Some of you got it on right now. You wearing it, got it on, have a purse, you know, a Gucci purse. And you, ain't telling, you ain't telling your sisters that thing ain't real. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> let, me get, let, me, let, me see, let me see if you can see the, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give a word. Immediately tell me the opposite. Love. Peace. peace truth. God, yeah. heaven, yeah. a boy, yeah. batteries have a plus and a, there's hot and cold. The opposite of north is, yeah. the opposite of east is, yes. the opposite of left is, right. the opposite of a conservative is a liberal, that's right, in, in, in culture. Yeah, I, just, I don't know where that came from. That wasn't in the notes. I just thought that was a good one. <laughs> but they're opposites. They're, they're actually opposites. The opposite of good is 
the opposite of being free is to be have you noticed that when Satan fell God had absolute life. Everything was about life. He even created a tree of life. But when Satan fell and God made Adam and Eve, he had to put two trees in the garden that were opposite. Tree of life. You eat from it, you live forever. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. If your eyes are open, it brings death. So in other words, the fall of Satan brought death into a world that at the time did not know what death was. But I'm about to tell you something that I saw that jacked up my spirit. I'm talking about in a big time way. Because the Lord spoke to me. He said, now let me tell you, son, my what the, what the greatest weapon the church has. And sometimes they don't sing about it enough. And sometimes they don't preach about it enough. And sometimes they don't talk about it enough. And sometimes they don't edify themselves enough. But here's what I've got to tell you. Here's what the Lord says. There is nothing opposite of the blood of Jesus. Woo! Come on, somebody. There ain't nothing opposite. Someone said sin. No, 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 no. Sin's not opposite of the blood because the blood has no sin. So someone said it's this, it's this. No, it's not. I challenge you to think it out. The one thing that God put on the planet, the one thing that God allowed to redeem us. For the Bible says we're redeemed by the blood and then we're sanctified by the blood and then we're washed in the blood and then we're justified by the blood and then by his stripes, which is his blood, we are healed. And by the nail prints, we are redeemed. Can I tell you, there's power in the blood of the Lamb because there's nothing in the universe that is an opposite of the blood. It stands alone. It stands above. It stands beyond. My God, somebody in the house, help me praise God. Woo, Jesus. Now the verse, the verse that I could have given you in the beginning, but I want you to hear this, is Revelation chapter 12, 11. I'm sorry, 10 and 11. I heard a voice from heaven saying, now has come salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren. This is Satan. Is cast down which accused them before God day and night. And they, that's the saints, overcame him, Satan, by The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Get ready. I'm going to give you a one-liner, a tweetable moment. Well, well, well. The power that is in the blood is the secret I'm I'm, I'm, I'm gonna rephrase this because I want you to get this. All power, all potential power over all the powers of the enemy is in the blood. Over everything. But your victory lies in your testimony. Now get this. Let me say it again because I don't want you to miss it. The blood of Jesus has power over every tool, tactic, sin, disease of the enemy that he will ever have in his arsenal. It it has been that way for thousands of years since the resurrection. But to have victory, that's why he didn't say, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. He didn't put a period there. But he said, and... By the word of your testimony. Now, I'm going to tell you what. It got a mighty hit. I'm going to tell you the word testimony is a legal judicial word. Uh, track with me. I'm about to go somewhere for just a minute. So if I were a judge and they uh, sent you a subpoena to come to court, you have to go to court or you're in contempt of court and can be arrested. How many know what I'm talking about? That's... I watch Perry Mason all the time. You know what I'm talking about? I, I could have been a lawyer after watching him of the 50th rerun of Perry Mason. I think I like him because he has the name Perry, and I can't find nobody on the planet named Perry. 
It must have been an old name years ago. So anyway, what they will do is bring you to do what at the, at the stand, swear in that you're going to tell the truth, and then take the stand to give a, yes, a testimony. Now, here's the thing that you need to know. If you were there and present and you are a true witness, what you say can either take the person being accused and send them to prison or what you say before the court as a witness can actually cause a jury to say there is just not enough proof. And the next thing you know, the person is released because the testimony, come on, so help me somebody. And all it ever takes, all it ever takes is one person given the right testimony. All it ever takes is one person understanding the judicial power of the testimony. And I want you to know that when you go before God and the devil's trying to slander your reputation, he's trying to lie on you, he's trying to falsely accuse you, you got people that are all over your case and you know it ain't right and you know what they say ain't right and you know what they're doing ain't right. There's one way you can handle it. You can either handle it by your flesh and you can say, I'm going to hire somebody to take care of this and it ain't going to be the right thing and you're going to end up in trouble yourself. Are you going to put your hands up in the middle of the night? You're going to lay on your bed crying saying these words. I don't know how I get out of this. I don't know what God's going to do about it, but I want you to know I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus and I overcome this by the word of my testimony. You know, everybody in this room and the reason we're hooping and hollering and shouting is we've been there. Y'all been there, I've been there. But I was, I was in, a, in a situation a while back and I kept thinking, God, I don't understand this. Why, 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 what's the deal? Why, why, why? But I kept talking about, now stay with me here now. Don't, don't leave me hanging on the line. Not now. And, 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 and I was talking about what the enemy was doing. And boy, the enemy's attacking. And you know what the Lord spoke to me? And I know it came from the Lord because I couldn't have thought of this. He said, son, you know, your adversary's biggest sin was what? I said, pride. I said, do you know, do you know how he feels or how the kingdom of darkness feels when you keep bragging on what he's doing? Oh, my Lord. I was at my desk and I put my hands down. I said, speak, Lord. He said, the ego of the adversary. There's your message, the ego of the adversary. But the ego of the adversary is, see what I did. I took, I, I had the hedge of Job taken down. I brought a whirlwind that brought his house down and killed 10 of his kids. I did this and I did that. And when you align yourself in a testimony about your test and you keep bragging on, I don't know what I'm going to do if God don't. I don't know where I'm going if God don't. I just don't know how bad. The, I'm telling you, the Lord dealt with me and he said, here's what you need to do. You need to shut up and quit talking about everything the devil's doing and you need to get a revelation of your testimony and say, devil, you ain't going to get it. You might try to get the ministry, but you ain't going to get it. You might try to steal the anointing, but you ain't going to take it. You might try to take out the word, but you can't. You can't destroy what cannot be destroyed. You cannot destroy the word of Almighty God. I love a I mean, healing, healing is by his stripes. Salvation is by the nail prints in his hand. Your mental battle was defeated by the, cross, the thorns on his head. Your heart that's wounded, he took the wound when the spear went into his heart and cut it. 
So what he did, the Bible said he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. And Matthew says he bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. If I, this is what the Lord started talking to me about. I'm talking after a long war. He said, you got to understand, why do you keep carrying what I already took off? Oh, God, a revelation, a revelation came to my spirit. And I wanted God to clarify something. I'm almost done, but you can be seated for just a minute. I wanted God to clarify. I said, show me, show me, show me, show me the one thing. Show me. And I had a dream. This is, this is, a, this is many, many months ago, but I want to tell you this dream because it was very significant. I went into a building this dream. Now, how many of you know when you have a spiritual dream, it'll stay with you? A corn cob pinto bean pizza dream comes and goes in about 48 hours, okay? This, was, this one, I can see it to this moment. I have a briefcase I travel with, and when I roll it, I pull that handle up, you know, and roll it. Some of you have those. And I have a suitcase that I travel with. I have it with me uh, most of the time. And I'm standing in this room as though I'm watching an invisible hand pick up the briefcase, the handle, and then it picked up the suitcase, and then it starts rolling them away from me. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? I saw a double glass door, and it was going to take my briefcase and suitcase out the door. And I said, no, you're not. That had to do with traveling. And I knew what it represented in the dream. So help me. Now, I'm telling you, this happened. This is not an embellishment. I'm telling it just like it happened. When I turned to those doors, see the suitcase and briefcase were here. The doors were there. When I turned to the door, I look, and I hear a voice from heaven say this. What you need to do is call upon angelic assistance to fight what you can't fight. I heard it. I heard an audible voice. I'm not telling you it was God or an angel. It was audible male voice. I went, whoa, what do I do? Now, I know this is going to sound strange, and people think I'm off on a deep end, but I'm 63 and don't care what you think. Just so you'll know. Just so you'll know. Mm-hmm. I heard the Lord say, I want you to call on Michael, the archangel, and Gabriel. And I'm thinking to myself in the dream, now wait a minute. Those angels are reserved for guys like Daniel and, you know, wrestling over the body of Moses. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a preacher out there preaching. She says, no, you don't understand the battle. You tell Michael to go fight the demons that's attacking you through people. I said, okay, I get it now. He said, you tell him to tell. And I'm telling you, I start to say, I, I, I called on Gabriel and Michael, the archangel. And when I turned this way, there's a hallway that's about from where I'm standing to your exit doors. And everybody can look that way. You just kind of see the distance. Narrow hallway, straight, no doors back there. And guess who I see appearing? I've only seen him twice in uh, for 41 years, Satan. And let me tell you, he doesn't have horns. He doesn't have a red tail. He's not red. You know, he's not, he's not ugly. He, he, he's a very strong, very, if I can use the word built, but he has his own armor on. And I can't even describe it, but he has an armor that he wears. So I didn't see flesh. I didn't see anything spirit, but I saw, I saw him and he starts walking toward me. And I said, oh my goodness, of all things. I mean, look, if it was a Mickey Mouse demon, I don't mean Mickey Mouse in a bad way. Mickey Mouse is not a... But if it was one of those basic demons, I'd be hooping and hollering and, and casting it out of the house or the building I was in or whatever. But I'm thinking, oh, no. What does this mean? And I heard the voice the second time, and this time I heard these words. This is the exact statement. Command Satan to get behind you in the name of Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name for Jesus. And I always pray in the name of Jesus. I traditionally have always prayed that way. Uh, nothing wrong with praying in the name of Jesus. It's a transliteration of his name from Greek or praying in the name of Yeshua because how many know God knows who you're talking to? I mean, he knows. The Lord knows who, who, the Lord knows who he is. Come on, somebody. Okay? Whatever, whatever holy name you wish to use. Now, I said, Satan, and that's how you say it in Hebrew. Satan, get behind me in the name of Yeshua. And he was about five feet from that door and I saw him stumble. 
He just stumbled. He didn't fall down. He stumbled. I said, whoa. I said, well, praise God. That did it. And he kept, and then he got, he composed himself, and he kept walking, just glaring at me. And I said, in, Satan, in the name of Yeshua, I command you to get behind me. And he stumbled again. Then I remembered, God Almighty, that he came to Jesus three times with three temptations, and Jesus rebuked him how many times? And the last thing that Jesus said that sent him running was, get behind me. The third time, this is going to help somebody because I don't think this is just for me. This is something for you. But the third time, I, yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, there was an energy of God that came on me. Something rose. Satan, I said, I command you in the name of Yeshua, you get behind me. When I said it under the anointing, his left leg gave out and he fell on his left side. And he couldn't get back up to reach where I was. And I want you to know it was about six months later that God gave us the breakthrough that we needed to stop the plan and the attack of the enemy against our life, physical life, physical health, physical life, everything. And I want to tell you something. That's a word for you because, ladies and gentlemen, the power is in the name. The power is in the word. The power is in the blood. But the victory is in your testimony. You got to talk it before it ends. You got to talk it up. You got to brag on the blood. Quit bragging on the devil. Brag on Jesus. Oh. Now. I want to tell you one more one story, and we're going to pray. Maya, uh, I have, someone asked me, how, how come Pam don't come up? Because Pam don't like to fly up and fly back. She wants to go, she wants to be in bed by 1030. <laughs> and we got three grandbabies next door. So bigger meetings should come. The one night meeting, she says, honey, it's too much for me. It'll, it'll, uh, okay, fine. But I have, if you've ever met her, I've had, I have a really remarkable, very godly, sensitive, wise wife. Uh, and I want to honor her. She, she's, uh, I've, I've been married 41 years. <laughs> this is a joke now, so don't get, get upset with me. But you ever had anybody introduce the first lady, but there were five other ladies beside the first lady, you know what I'm saying? No, th this is my first lady and only lady. I want you to understand. 41 years of first lady, only lady. So there's not other ladies. It's, it's, it's Pam and Pam only. Uh, she's, she's walked through a lot of things, a lot of attacks. She, she has a knee that the meniscus was torn in it and never healed. She stays in pain all the time. Uh, I had physical problems where they thought I was going to die in just a few years. I had a melanoma brain tumor. I could just go on and on, just, just everything, plus some belligerent ex-staff people, just all kinds of stuff, crazy stuff going on, right? Well, she's not a shouter. She is a, uh, this is about the most you're going to get out of her. <laughs> really. But she is really like this, solid as a rock. Now, I miss service this night. I'm making a point. I miss service this night on a Tuesday night where we have our service. Dr. Cutshaw was preaching. And I said, Dr. Cutshaw, I'm really exhausted. I'm going to go to sleep if I go to church. I'm just going to sit on the road. I'm going to go to sleep, and I don't want to do that. He said, brother, just take a night. It's fine. And I miss this. We had a Hispanic uh, evangelist, and I wish I could remember his name, but he's, he was very well known. So he got up, and... I never heard this song. You probably have heard it up here. It may have originated somewhere up in the Chicago area. I don't know. But it's all over the internet. I had never heard it. And this guy got up and started singing a song that set my wife on fire. Never saw it in my life till, till she got, and it was on, it was on, uh, on, on the uh, social media. She got in the front and started walking up. And I've never seen her do this, walk up and down the aisles, almost shouting. I thought, dear God, there's a God in heaven. Look at this. <laughs> she just looked at me. And, 
And the song was, it's just a real simple chorus. God made it fail. Anybody heard it? He made it fail. Everything that the devil tried, God made it fail. He made it fail. Oh, he made it fail. He made it fail. Everything that the devil tried, God made it fail. That song got in her spirit till every morning she was singing, cooking breakfast. God made it fail. And I said, well, let's just listen to it. And there's a brother from the Carolinas that sings it, that tears it up. And I, I, I've listened to it a hundred times. So we go turn it on and we just be hopping around saying, Can they, but let me tell you why it began to happen. This is a true story and I won't go into details. But all of a sudden we heard a piece of news that was good news. And my wife said, God made it fail. Then a few weeks later, we heard another piece of news that was amazing news. And my wife said, God made it fail. And finally, we got the big news. And I was singing and she was singing and we, she was crying on the phone. He made it fail. He made it fail. Everything that the devil tried, God made. Does it fail? How does it fail? Because you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and then Ebukoshat and by the word of your testimony. Somebody jump up on your feet and begin to praise God for the blood of Jesus. Somebody get up. Come on. Everything that the devil tried, God made it fail. God made it fail. He made it fail. Well, oh, he made it fail. <laughs> Everything the devil tried, God made it fail.
He made it fail. Oh, he made it fail. I said everything that the devil tried. God made it fail. Oh, he made it fail. Oh, he made it fail. Everything. Come on, give the praise break one more time. tonight you know with everything that all of us have been through even back to the COVID days and that's thank God that's about over I just about is I think they've announced it's pretty much over now but with everything everybody's been through there are times that you need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit I mean you just need the Holy Spirit to stir up the gift and you need to hear yourself praying in a powerful prayer language from God and everybody that needs a refilling of the Holy Spirit, run up here and just stand across the front. Come on, right now. You know who you are. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Keep filling up the front. Yes, 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 yes. What was that? What was that song, Pastor, that they sang at the inauguration? You said they sang a gospel song. Can, can you all just play that on the keyboards for just a minute, real soft? It, yeah. Listen to me carefully. What we're going to do, it's, it's the presence of God that does this. And I can tell the atmosphere is prepared. You know, when you feel the Lord the way you do, do you know what's happening? The anointing in you is being released in the atmosphere through your praise and worship. And everybody can, anybody sensitive to God can feel it. But in a moment, I want you to lift your hands. I'm going to pray over you. And I want you to let God stir you up. And the Bible says, stir up the gift. The Greek there means rekindle the fire. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. The gift of God is there, but sometimes cares of life and things just press you down and you just don't have the liberty to, to be refilled. And I want you to raise your hands and let me say something. The power of God comes on you and you can't stand to your feet. Don't fall backwards because there's too many people. Go down on your knees and keep praying if you can, but let's, let, let's raise our hands right now. Let's raise our hands. Everybody in the congregation, you've to, if you'd like to stand with us, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you right now because I felt led that a lot of people needed to hear them, their spirit, their spirit pray in the language of God to encourage them that you are not only there, but you're praying the will of God through them. I, re I resist every hindrance that has tried to attack your mind the past couple weeks or months. I resist the life that Satan has tried to put you in that you know you don't want. And you know you want to live free and you want to live to be a delivered person. You want to be able to go to church and not feel condemned. You want to be able to, for the shame to be removed by the blood of Jesus. So I pray over you right now and apply the blood of Jesus by faith over your mind, over everything in your past, over everything, every guilt, every condemnation. In Jesus' name. Now, God, I ask you to send the Holy Ghost right now to the people and stir up the gift. Stir it up in the name of Jesus. When I say, when I say receive in Jesus' name, you will raise your hands up and God's power will touch you. And you're going to be praying in, in tongues. You're going to be praying in the Holy In the name of Jesus right now. Don't quit. Come on. Praise in the Holy Ghost. Worship in the Holy Ghost. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, loud, 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 pray out loud. Speak in the Holy Ghost. 
Ghost right now. Open up your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost out loud. The language of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Jesus in your name. Jesus in your name. Now raise your hands again and just begin to worship him out loud with your mouth. Forget about who's beside you and around you. Lift your hands. I want just the voices without any music to sing it again. You are the source of my strength. So one of the ladies lead that and let everybody just stall with just the singers only. Come on. You are the source of my strength. Everybody sing it. Come on. Worship him from your spirit while you hear this.
Let there be a roar in your spirit and clap your hands. Hallelujah. It was a moment in the inauguration in Chicago of the new transfer of powers of the mayor. They were singing that song. And this is, you know, one of the Clark sisters. Carrie Clark, who's married to the head bishop of Church of God in Christ, the largest, largest um, denomination in the United States. And they had sing a man with her, the choir. Seven or 8,000 people, whatever that number was there. And most people were to their feet. And this is inauguration. And you can tell the battle of, be careful, we don't want to have too much church. So we hit that, oh, man. And everybody sat down in the new elected mayor, Brandon Johnson, was the only one standing on the platform of about 150, the aldermen, the governor, and congressmen, and he had his eyes closed. So he's the only one. He's about ready to be sworn in to, as a new uh, mayor of Chicago. When he opened his eyes, he realized he was the only one standing. And all of a sudden, the choir began to sing softly this song. I was on the front row with Kent and Allie, and we were there, and some of our great friends, Bishop Horace Smith was right there, and James Meeks, and I couldn't help but say, come on in, God. And I don't know the words that I said, but I, I looked at the corner of my eyes, saw Bishop Poor Smith get on his feet again. And of course, I got on my feet and Pastor Kent got on his feet. And, and not that we led anybody, but everybody, I mean everybody, even J.B. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois, he, and Jesse Jackson got out of his wheelchair standing up and... Man, you can say what you want to say, but God came into the room. And everybody, everybody here, what you heard tonight, 63 years, probably 50 of, it, of, of preaching years, <laughs> all of you tonight, did you, did you hear what you heard? I mean, I mean... It takes five years of seminary. It takes hours of studying. And he rattled it off of revelation about the blood and God. Oh, did anybody, did anybody take approval of that? You know, I know that um, we're always trying to relate with people. But let me tell you, nothing works like the Word of God. Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Tonight, all of you, you, you heard. You say, well, I didn't understand everything. Well, if you'll read the Bible, you'll have an appreciation of uh, what Perry Stone spoke tonight will give you great victory. And in that moment, I stood to my feet. I think I said this. I want to be, I hope I say it right, but tears running down my face. Inauguration would come up a second time in a place. You could feel it. I think Bob, better than you told me you felt it on television. People felt it on television, I think. And I said these words, Satan, take your hands off this city. I think I said... Of that. This is not about more policemen. 
and we need more policemen and we need more law and we need more order this is about us facing the demon and saying take your hands off my children take your hands off my marriage get behind me take your hands come on you're going to have to learn how to warfare and that's the truth really really I just can't believe you guys ate this much food spiritually tonight. Did you enjoy the word of the Lord and Perry? Wow, it was so. So enriching. And all many of you received the Holy Spirit. Some of you spoke in tongues for the very first time. How many got a refreshing all over the building, a refreshing? I'm so moved that tonight that the Lord, because uh, Perry told me, he said, I'm going to preach, sing King, sing King or something. And he said, did Jensen preach that? Because Jensen preaches with Perry, preaches and, you know, we all get mixed up and preach everywhere and don't know who's preached what. But the Lord really spoke to him. and, And I know that what he spoke tonight was just for you and for me. And I want to tell you something. Do not think, don't let people think you're weird when you rebuke the devil. Don't, don't, don't think you're a weirdo. And, and the church is made to feel like, you know, you can't pray that kind of prayer. Take authority over the spirits. And everybody say, in the name of Jesus. How many times have I told you Melody does this? When it gets bad in the house, she opens up the door and says, Spirit, leave right now. You go on out of here right now. You got to open the door. I want to thank the singers tonight. I want to pray for you before you go, but I want to tell you, don't forget what you've heard. It'll help you in life. It'll help your children. Don't be afraid. If you ride with me in my car, I may be talking to you about something, but you'll, you'll see me. It's just a habit. Sometimes I have to withdraw if somebody's new in the car. I put my hand up. I just pray. I pray for the houses in my subdivision. No suicide spirits. No divorce spirits. I pray for angels to march up and down. All of you need to do that in your households. All of you need to learn that when you drive home tonight, take authority on your block. There will be no shootings on this block. I bind the spirit. And everybody shout amen. Amen. Take what you've learned tonight, what you've heard. It is really, really real. I tell you 30 seconds, I was in India. We were going through the hundred and some thousand people. And they threw a demon-possessed person on the car. And Dr. Paulson and I were leaving this huge, you know, the new church he just built, 51,000 people. Probably the largest church in the world now. I'm not quite sure. And this demon, I mean, it was, it was manifesting. And he grabbed, you know, where the windshield wipers are, this SUV. And he's banging his head against the windshield. Slime is over. I mean, it is, I mean, it was just manifest. I'm talking about demon spirits. And Dr. Paulson and I, talk, he, and I had to go through an interpreter because he didn't know English. And I'm wondering what in the world? And Dr. Paulson is so used to that, he just threw his hand out and said, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood. He did it in his own language. And right there in front of my eyes, this demon-possessed person jumps off of the car, lifts his hands, starts smiling, And the power of God took all those demons out of him. And you could see all the people that were rejoicing. Listen, it is real. Whatever you're going through tonight, your business, your child, your marriage, whatever, say this out loud with me. Say, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, I plead the blood blood 
of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ. Get out. Get out. Leave, now. Leave now. And what he told you, the Bible says if you will resist the devil, he will flee. Did you hear that? He didn't walk away. He didn't crawl away. He flees. So anything that's going on in your life, you heard a word. Take authority over it and believe. Now, Father, I thank you for this Holy Spirit moment. Oh, God, we're, you're here. You're here. You're here. You're here. Thank you, Jesus, for being here. Lord, I take authority over cancer and stomach issues and depression and fear, poverty, discouragement. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Take your hands, take your spirit off of every person, every child, every person in this house. And let the blood of Jesus set them free. In Jesus' name. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Let, let's rehearse before we go home tonight a few lines. Let's do it together. It's very biblical. Say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I take authority. I take authority. Over fear. Over fear. Discouragement. Discouragement. Poverty. Poverty. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I rebuke you. I rebuke you. Off of my children. Off of my family. Off of my job. Go. Go. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That's what you got to do. Is thank you, Lord. Turn to two or three people and say, I'm free. Be back here Sunday. I'm free. God bless you. What a Wednesday night. What a great Wednesday night. God bless you. Wow, wasn't that incredible? Perry Stone. I love when he calls the people forward that want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit no telling how many tonight received the baptism. It, it was so moving and it, I hope you received it. If you, if you do not have the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, I hope that that came upon you as well as it came upon those that stood uh, at the altar because it was a mighty demonstration. Well, I'm excited about the continuation of May Miracles. Next week, I'm going to be praying for finances. Finances. I'm asking the people to bring their bills or to write their bill or their debt. And next Wednesday night, I'm going to burn it. I'm going to burn it. So people will put it on a card. Don't have to put their name on it. You can email it in and we will burn it. We're going to burn debt. If you're in debt, next week is going to be, we're coming out of debt. How God can bless us. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that great to pray that prayer or to believe that kind of prayer? To be prayed and to believe that God will bless us? That's what's going to happen next Wednesday night. Also, I want to tell you, I am very, very excited about the new series, Summer Sizzle, that will start June 14th. And I'm so excited because it's about bigger, better, boldness of blessing. God is getting ready to bless us like we have never been blessed before. And my new book, my new book, Bigger, Better, Bolder Blessings, is going to start and we are going to enter into a dimension of blessings like we have never experienced. Father's Day coming up. Can't wait. 
all of you fathers, it's going to be a great day with gifts and celebration and just God is doing great thing. And then one more thing that is very important, and that is Memorial Day prayer. We change, we change, we change the states, we change the nation, we change the world through prayer. We've seen gasoline drops, we've seen inflation stop, and Memorial Day prayer, we are gonna believe God for the impossible, protecting the children through the summer months from drowning in bullets. So I want to get you excited about Memorial Day prayer, which is coming up on Memorial Day. Well, I can't wait till Sunday, it's gonna be great. Thank you, thank you, every one of you who support, who give, who continue to give, you haven't stopped, thank you. And may God bless you as the kingdom of God goes forward in Jesus' name. I'll see you Friday morning of prayer or Sunday at the services that will be provided for you right here on this same streaming channel. God bless you and remember, yes, you can.